And Thank our so next much. presenter is Sarah Gulickson. And she's going to be talking about market analysis and to segue from Leslie's State of the Union address, opportunities. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you? Fantastic. Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. So, a little bit about yourself. How'd you get in the cannabis industry? And when did you get in the cannabis industry? Okay. Um, So I've been in the cannabis industry 12, almost 13 years. I actually got into the cannabis industry when Arizona was legalizing. Um, And I had a small marketing agency and a company came to me and said, hey, can you help us, you know, get the word out in the community about, you know, what's coming for Arizona? Um, I was young and I had, you know, a naturopathic background in the sense that I always had believed in alternative medicines. Um, my sister was was sick when we were younger. And so my mom turned to naturopathic solutions to help kind of get her in a better place. And so it wasn't super foreign to me in the sense that it was, I looked at, I always have looked at it as medicine. Um, so I got involved. I really loved the journey. Um, Arizona was, you know, a fun process. You know, this is back when people were very against cannabis. We would have festivals and people would like throw things at us, but you know, I was young and I guess I had nothing to lose. So, um, you know, I wanted to spread the word about what was going on. Um, and then when we were successful in helping some people put together some applications for the Arizona process, Um, we kind of just kept our eyes on, you know, what the next state was. And then pretty much after that, I would go state to state to state and help uh, legislators put together rules and regulations for their programming, as well as help entrepreneurs submit um, their cannabis RFP or RFA, a request for application or request for proposal. Um, So I've been doing that for, I guess, 12 years. 13 years. I sold my first cannabis consulting company back in 2018. Um, and since I've, you know, acquired about eight licenses myself. So I have licenses in, um, North Dakota, Michigan, where else? Ohio and Nevada. Um, and so it's just really been a wild ride. Um, I kicked back, um, into gear after my non-compete and, um, you know, opened another cannabis consulting company. And so we're actively helping people, um, develop their applications as well as helping, you know, people that have received their licenses, open their facilities. So this year we'll open probably about 11 to 12 facilities with either my projects or for clients. Um, we have a vertical in West Virginia that we're working on opening, um, a vertical in Missouri, and then a dispensary in uh, Benton Harbor, Michigan. So super exciting year. Um, I know that a lot of people are kind of down and, and, you know, life's been a little bit different for all of us. But I would say the last couple of weeks in cannabis have been, you know, some of the biggest with New York legalizing, uh, New Mexico on the horizon, movement in New Jersey. Um, so I'm just super happy to be here and I'll kind of, you know, explain some of the different opportunities that we have. Um, you know, over the next couple of years. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Um, quick question. How do you feel that the pandemic has shaped the legalization effort? So that's an interesting question question. I'm, I try to be more of a positive person. So I don't like to get into the doom and gloom. I think the pandemic was amazing for my family, for my career. Um, you know, obviously I'm not insensitive to the struggles that a lot of people have, have been through, but you have to make, get, you have to, you know, kind of make your path and and make your life what you want it to be. And so I always try and choose, you know, positivity and happiness. Um, you know, I think it was disappointing because there were supposed to be 11 states that had ballot initiatives back in November. November, um, and only five, you know, ended up getting pushed through because they had problems collecting signatures. And then some of the governors just said, Hey, you know, we, we really can't do this right now. We're, we're, you know, dealing with a global pandemic. Um, however, all five ended up moving forward. So that's progress. And then now what we're seeing, like in New York, where Como said, hey, we were supposed to do this, but we couldn't do this. But guess what? Now he's signing the legislation. So it's still moving forward. Um, you know, I think that a lot of states will have to look at this as an opportunity for revenue, um, tax revenue. 
Um, and obviously, if there's a little bit of an economic downturn, which everyone's obviously anticipating, you know, this is a really, really, really good way to, um, you know, create jobs, create revenue, um, and create, you know, taxable dollars that can go back into the state to, you know, build the state back up. So at the end of the day, you know, as essential businesses, I think that a lot of the dispensaries that were open were, were flourishing during this time. Um, and I think that, you know, it will continue to, to go on that path forward. Thank you. We have seen opportunity um, come out of this crisis. So we're, we're seeing what you're seeing and um, it's, it's a really good thing. So can you tell us a little bit about your business and, and what your offerings are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Cannabis Business Advisors is a cannabis consulting company. So if you are either an entrepreneur looking to get a license, we can help you not only with application, but also with M&A. Um, and so we can kind of present some opportunities that are available in the states that are you know allowed to basically transfer or sell the license. Um, and if you have a license and don't really necessarily know what to do with it, um, we can step in and act as almost like your quarterback um, to help you not only, you know, select operators, select product lines, um, really get your dispensary up and running, do competitive analysis on, you know, the space that you're opening in or the state you're opening in. Um, We also offer marketing and branding services. So we're a true business consultancy in the sense that, you know, cannabis hopefuls or cannabis entrepreneurs can come to us with their problems and we can troubleshoot if it's not something we offer specifically like what we don't do is you know get in the garden and you know help people cultivate we have really great partners that would be able to help um you know people with that as well so if we don't do it in house we have a really great strong network from being in the industry for you know 12 plus years to be able to you know just give a referral or you know kind of help people in that way Uh, That's great, because we have had inquiries from people that are interested in opening dispensaries. So is this coast to coast? Is it every state that you're able to operate in? Yeah, so the first, obviously. Yeah, the firm specializes in competitive merit-based application processes. So think of Hawaii when there were 10 licenses available, um, or Pennsylvania when there were, you know, 120 some odd licenses available. So that's what we really specialize in, I believe, um, to keep the firm very boutique that we can have that hands-on approach and really write a winning RFP. Um, that's not to say that we don't help in checklist processes um, like Oklahoma and some of the um, areas in California or in Colorado where they're not necessarily merit-based or limited license um, opportunities. Um, but I've actually had the opportunity to work all over the world. Um, I've worked in a couple different countries and and coast to coast in the United States. So I have a ton of experience. um, And I really think my experience just comes in where, you know, I can use my marketing background to really get into the weeds with the program to say, what does this program need? What does this community need? And what is this about? Um, We're very selective with picking our clients in the sense that I don't want to take funds from anybody if I don't really feel like they have the ingredients on their team to actually do this. Um, So that's why we like to kind of keep the firm small and boutique and, you know, we work on about 10 to 15 projects a year and, you know, that pretty much gets us um, to where we want to go. Um, my track record of success is one of the most important things to me in the sense that, you know, I, I, I like to win and I like to win with and for clients. Um, and so we just don't feel right about, you know, maybe taking somebody that didn't have the right ingredients to be one of these, um, you know, cannabis business leaders, I would say. And so in the United States, with the changes that have occurred, uh, what's the most exciting thing for you? You know, New York is is very exciting to me. Um, before the pandemic, I actually was um, lucky enough to go and meet with um, – some of the decision makers and they were obviously talking about hemp and and THC and expanding their program and going recreational. And, um, you know, I was able to go to the Capitol and have a seat at that table. And so, um, you know, New York's a really special place. And um, now that things are getting pushed through and I was able to kind of advise them on, you know, potentially how to do that. um, I'm just very, very excited about the opportunity of New York. Um, I also think that a lot of states are going to follow suit after New York just because of what New York is for the United States of America. 
That's incredible. Um, I, I can recall back in uh, 2014 when the very first Cannabis Expo happened in New York City, and it was a jaw dropper for sure. Um, Which one are you taken. talking about? The Javits Center? Yes. It's yeah, Javits Center. I was speaking yeah. at that one, and it just became, it was so incredible. So incredible. You remember the energy there and the excitement? It, it, it was literally incredible. I was there uh, running PR. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the stories that came out and the hope for the people. Yeah. Um, it's, been a, it's been a long time, long time coming. So, um, Jessica, there you are. Hi there. Do you have a question for Sarah? Actually, I do. I would like to know, what are some of the alternatives to entering the cannabis space for those who don't win a license? Absolutely. Oh, um, I love this question. I actually was able to go and do a show um, with Tony Robbins, and he was having a real estate, cryptocurrency, and cannabis expo. And so realistically, what that you know conference was all about is, is business opportunities, not necessarily on the side of throwing 500 or a million or $10 million into the industry, but really figuring out you know how you can make your place in the cannabis industry um, if you want to be a part of you know either working at a facility or building a business around the cannabis industry. So I always use my story because because that's the one I'm the most intimate with. So, you know, 12 years ago, I didn't have money in the bank to open a cannabis facility, um, but I did have a skill. And so I looked at my skill. It was marketing and public relations and branding. And I leveraged that skill to help a consulting company break into a new market, which was Arizona. And, you know, with that said, I, I worked, I, you know, educated myself. I never claimed to be the smartest, but I worked probably the hardest. Um, and I ended up purchasing that company and then building that company and selling that company. So, you know, whether you have a skill like security or interior design or marketing or, you know, just all the picks, pans and the shovels to support the industry, it really tr takes a creative thinker to look at their skill set and see how they can apply it to this industry because this industry is, is large. And I always invite people to get into the industry because we need talent. Um, we need to keep building, you know, at the speed of light. So questions. And I have been preaching what you just said since 2013, and you would not believe the resistance that is put up from mainstream businesses. <gasps> we can't come into that industry. Well, it's brand new. Come on. I mean, who, who wouldn't want a wide open playing field to play on? Come on. So um, as a, a business consultant, what is missing in the ancillary business space? What do you see from the mainstream corporate America that really has to have a presence in the industry to help it grow? I mean, I would say everything. We just don't have enough talent in the industry. You know, there's there's a lot of very talented people, but at, at the rate that the industry is growing, we don't have enough support. And unfortunately, you know, I think a lot of people have gotten into the industry because they see that quick dollar and they want to, you know, get in and make it. And so it's, it's troublesome to the you know new entrepreneurs that want to get into the industry because at that at what point where do you start? How do you know who's credible? How do you know who actually knows what they're talking about versus somebody that's just wanting to grab a quick twenty five k catch from you? Um, you know, I, I really think you know HR. I think technology. I think um, you know good business leaders that can come in and you know run the analytics of the company. And obviously, there's a handful of organizations that are running these businesses like you know real businesses. Um, but like even myself, I got into the industry when I was 26. I had my MBA, but I didn't understand business per se. Um, so like, what about coaches? What about mentors? What about think tanks? What about groups for somebody like me that have been in the industry for a long time and maybe feel like we're plateauing and, and, and you know, need that kind of support? Um, I really think that the options are so endless and it takes, you know, a creative person with the right intentions to launch something incredible in the space. Oh, that's awesome. Charles, I see you've joined us. Do so you, you know what, Sarah? It kind of sort of, in a way, kind of sums up a little bit about what Canna World Expo is all about. Hmm. Well, good. <laughs> <You have it. laughs> sort of I can help. figured that one out because we have been bringing healers, industry experts, 
uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, those who have pioneered in the industry to research. We've been bringing it all together. And it's been a year that we started this all online. It's, it's been this journey of growth and expansion. Um, you know, Charles has kind of been here with us for a long time as well on, on the journey. So it's, uh, it's an exciting one. And thank you for bringing that one up. Absolutely. You guys do a great thing here. Sarah, I wanted to ask you with all of your diverse background, there is a big uh, difference between how, say, Hawaii operates with licenses and, uh, and then uh, Oklahoma, which is pretty wide open. What do you think is the best way that a state should operate? What's the best way for the state? What's the best way for somebody wanting to get into the industry? Yeah, so that's like a super, super interesting topic, especially to me, because one of the reasons that we're good is because we have that history and we have that real world experience where we went through Pennsylvania, we went through Hawaii. And so we really understand the good, bad and ugly of all the programs. Right. Um, and so at any rate, it would be us that would maybe be able to come up with a universal plan. However, that's not what I believe in. Um, I'm, on the other opposite side of the spectrum where, you know, I'm terrified for the federal government to get involved in this. I think that there's the federal, federal things federal government can do to alleviate some of the stress on banking, um, you know, and some of the things that make us like fake businesses or not looked at as credible businesses with 280E and things like that. However, um, you know, we worked in California pretty heavily when, you know, the state went from municipality ran to state ran. And I'm not saying that that shouldn't have happened. You know, the state should get involved so that there's one set of rules and regulations so that the governments can kind of get out of the gray and operate black and white. Um, but when they laid the state regulations over the top of the different municipalities, there's there's a history of that not making sense. So they don't jive together anytime you stack regulations. Um, here in Arizona, it's a perfect example too. We had an old program, we didn't have testing. They wrote a testing bill, stacked it on top of the regulations, and, it, and it's, it's still not rolled out, and it was supposed to be rolled out over six months ago. So I, I don't unfortunately think that there's a one- size fits all approach to cannabis, especially since we're so far down the track. Um, you know, we have, you know, at least something happening in most states in the United States, whether that's a limited CBD program, medical or recreational. Um, you know, so how do you come in and take the best of all worlds and then try and force it down the throats of, you know, the different states? Um, what I like and what I see as a, a pattern in the industry is a lot of the regions stick together. Um, so the regions are, you know, somewhat similar in kind of their, you know, ideals and beliefs and, you know, how certain things work. And so a lot of times we'll see, you know, uh, West Virginia looking to Pennsylvania to say, hey, how should we do this? Let's take the best of their program and synthesize it, make a couple tweaks and edits, and then make it our own. Um, while that's kind of a cumbersome approach, because then obviously all of the states have different rules and regulations, um, I believe and I stand by that, you know, what what we're doing and what we have done is is mainly working. Another question for you, if you were uh, if you were to pick a state of all of the opportunities that are coming up right now, what where would be the best place for an entrepreneur to uh, to go that has the most opportunity, do you think? New York City. I mean, or New York, I should say, um, you know, they're doing a fine <clears throat> job, I think. I think that their medical program has struggled a bit because it was very stringent, very limited. Their qualified medical conditions right off the bat weren't um, a wide variety of things like a catch-all, like, you know, chronic pain and things like that. Um, and I think now what they're doing is kind of reworking what happened. And, um, you know, the fact that they're going for adult use or recreational um, doesn't mean that there can't be, you know, medical type brands and services within those verticals. Um, some of the reasons that I do think that it's a really great opportunity, um, other than the fact that it's New York, where there's obviously endless opportunity, um, you know, they've, they've carved out a lot of these licenses for, you know, diverse, diverse, you know, teams. So whether that's, you know, different backgrounds um, uh, or women, um, you know, 50% of those licenses will go to um, teams with diversity, which is, that's incredible in itself. Um, they've also 
up to the number of licenses in a significant way that it's not like an Oklahoma situation where there's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people getting in. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but now Oklahoma is kind of pulling the reins back on that and saying, hey, we, we went too wild. We need to um, limit the number of licenses or cap the number of licenses because a lot of people that have got those licenses haven't even opened in the store. And who knows if they ever even had intentions to open a store. Um, so, you know, the a couple hundred licenses is, 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 feels really good in New York, I think. Um, and then, uh, I really like the fact that, um, they have different verticals. So they have, you know, micro licenses and they have smaller opportunities for the people that don't have 10 million or 5 million or even a million to throw into the industry can potentially, you know, have a seat at the table and be a part of the industry in, in New York. Uh, I'm watching the uh, questions from the audience, so if anybody has one, please put it in, and I will ask it for you. But just to go a little different direction, uh, really uh, excited about all of the success you've had within the industry, and uh, so I know that there's a you know a female domination in the in the uh, cannabis industry, and you know I absolutely love it. But what do you think attracts so many females into the industry? You know, I like the conversation that everybody's having about women in the industry. I still think we have a long way to go. Um, you know, a lot of the women that are in the industry are, are working for men. Um, you know, there's not that many, you know, even when we look at like the makeup of the licensees here in Arizona, I think there's one women owned and operated facility out of 131. Like we have some work to do. Um, you know, we have to, you know, have programs that carve out, you know, minority groups in order to kind of even the playing field. Um, and we have to have women that are going to, um, you know, step up and, and decide that they want to be a part of the movement and, you know, put away some of their fears and, you know, be able to, you know, rise. Um, you know, I think that it's an amazing industry and there has been a lot of conversation about women, but in my opinion, I just, I really believe that we have a really long way to go. I think that the women topic often is a, a PR story and that's all. Um, I think that there's a lot of men leadership that will put a woman on the application or uh, put a woman in leadership, but not really let them lead. Um, and so for me, you know, I don't like to use the fact that I'm a woman to say, you know, hey, poor me, I haven't been able to do all these things that men can do. I've just had to kind of like figure out how to how to have a seat at the table and how to make sure that women have a part of the conversation. Um, but I, I really do believe that we have um, a, a very long way to go. Um, and I think that, you know, every single state should have some of these minority licenses. And I think that they should have, um, you know, women and and minorities be able to be a part of you know the conversation thank, thank you, you Sarah. Sarah I have a question for you as well uh, what type of investment and mergers and acquisition trends do you see going on in the market right now or foresee in the future it's crazy out there <laughs> I think I just read a piece that uh, the last couple of months have been the biggest months as far as, you know, the mergers and acquisitions that have taken, um, you know, place. And I think that that is actually an interesting conversation, especially when you talk about, you know, minority ran businesses or private companies, because I think that there are a lot of private deals that are happening that aren't the big MSOs kind of eating up the little guys that aren't really, that aren't making the media. You know, we know of licenses transferring and things like that, you know, all the time. Um, unfortunately, the barrier to entry to purchase these licenses is, is very high. Um, so obviously, the groups that can put together 40, 50, you know, $60 million are going to be a lot of the public companies and the MSOs. Um, and I think from a, you know, small operator perspective, um, you know, to be able to have a couple of stores really increases your bottom line or in order to be completely vertically integrated, you know, really, you know, helps the business out. So, um, you know, until we see more of these states go with more licensed types like California and New York are, is now, um, you know, Arizona, we're vertical here. So, I mean, in order to break into the industry and potentially, um, you know, become a part of an Arizona license, you know, you're looking at 14 million, if not more. So, um, 
it's, it's expensive. <laughs> um, and that's why like, you know, I'm a big fan of the application because you can usually get into the application and sure you don't know if you're going to win, but you know, if you kind of do what we tell you to do, put together a winning team, put together some capital, get some nice real estate and have a sound business plan where you've like carved your niche out and, you know, not just this generic thing of, you know, we want to be in the industry. You have a pretty good shot at it. Um, barrier to entry for application processes can be anywhere from, you know, let's call it 75 to, you know, 300,000. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question for you uh, coming in. And it wants to know if uh, cannabis business advisors recommends products to dispensaries and retail stores, such as hemp products. Yeah. So for a lot of our clients that were advising on the operations side of things, we're trying to put together very interesting rollout plans for them. So, you know, I think everybody in the beginning, you know, has an idea. They want this, 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 then throw it on the shelves. And in the beginning of a new market, that helps because supply and demand is an issue. But what we have to do is we really have to analyze the market. We have to hold some focus groups. We have to understand what the patient's or adult users would like to see. And in my opinion, I think rolling that out in an interesting way where you maybe feature a new product every month or every other month to keep your product line very interesting instead of doing BOGOs and you know advertising that way. It's like, why not bring new products to the market that the focus groups are telling you that they want on their shelves? So yes, we, we help you know clients kind of look at the market to see either what's coming in a new state or what's currently on the market um, and do focus groups and really help those dispensaries understand what their patient or user base is looking for, our consumer base is looking for. Has there been a group that you have encountered that has surprised you that has become a focus group? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, like, I think that obviously what you guys are doing, which is bringing, you know, professionals together. If there was a group that was doing focus groups that I didn't know about, so I didn't have to like schlep one together, I would be all for being like, hey, hire these guys. They're experts at this. Um, we've just done it kind of bootstrapped where it's like, you know, get some people in a room or get a survey monkey survey out and let's, you know, take the feedback in and, you know, put the, put the, you know, plan together wrapped around that. But, you know, Hey, I would, I, I would love it if there was a focus group doing this that I could recommend for my clients. Fantastic. Sarah, we've got just a couple minutes left. Do you have any final thoughts that you would like to convey to the audience, to the industry, you know, to whomever you choose to speak? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that I've said it multiple times is, you know, if you're thinking about getting in the industry and you just really don't know where to start, it's, you know, what are you good at? And, you know, how can you as, you know, a talented individual come and help us build this industry? Um, I was young when I got into the industry. I didn't have any plans for, you know, making money. I more wanted to make history. So, you know, come, come make history with us. That's a fantastic message. Thank you so, so very much for being with us today. It is really greatly appreciated. Thank you for your time, your wisdom, your knowledge, everything that you've done for the industry as well. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. And how do, sorry, uh, how do people get hold of you? The Cannabis Business Advisors is the business website. And if you can't remember that, sarahgullickson.com is another great resource. You know, send us a contact form. Um, you know, we have a gal that manages all the leads. And so if you have a message for me or somebody on my team, you know, we'll, we'll try and get back to you ASAP. And we'd love to chat. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. Thank you.